Now, Dimitar is a, I hear he's a, he's a metal head. And he's wearing, hey everybody. He's wearing his Iron Maiden t-shirt. Okay. Any fans right Any here? Any fans, Iron Maiden fans? <laughs> All right. Dimitar, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I told him you're his biggest fans. <laughs> I won't sing a lot, so don't worry. Uh, by the way, this is my first time in Greece, and that's strange because it, it occurred to me that my grandmother told me I have Greek ancestors. So my grand-grand-grandmother was Greek, so it's good to be in my grand-grand-grandmother's land. And by the way, this conference is awesome, so thank you very much. We have a saying in Bulgaria, I'm from Bulgaria, that when you go someplace new, people welcome you by the clothes and send you back by your brains. I'm asking you not to do that. Okay, my clothes are not the most welcoming, but once the session is over, you can kick me out, no problem. All right, first of all, a big shout out to my favorite Greek band. Does anybody know who these guys are? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, uh, their name is not the most pleasant one, so I'm not going to say it out loud, but if you want to know who these guys are, <laughs> it's Rotting Christ. Ooh, so evil. <laughs> yeah, but these guys are really good. I, I really like them. So, good job, guys. Uh, all right. Obviously, I'm a metalhead, right? And I read a lot of interviews. I follow my favorite bands wherever they go. And I watch uh, their YouTube movies and stuff. And one day, I was reading an interview by a guy called Marty Friedman. He's an ex-guitar player by a band called Megadeth. Do you know Megadeth? Of course. <laughs> so, this guy. I was reading the interview, and I'm like, Come on, really? If he was here on that stage instead of me, and he, if he just changed a few words to be not that music specific, you wouldn't be able to tell that this guy is a musician and not an agile coach. I was really, really inspired. So I decided that I should talk about that. This is Marty Friedman, by the way. He has the best hair. <laughs> a man could ever dream of, and maybe even a woman could dream of. So he's, he's really great. He's one of the best guitar players of our time. And see what he's saying. I have to read that. I haven't memorized it yet. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of guitar hero types have a lot of people copying them. You can get pretty close to your heroes by learning all the mechanics. But copying others is not necessarily the best thing because you might try to play something really far away from what you can actually get under your fingers. This is bold because it's obviously what we should focus on. The first thing I heard entering that door today around 10, 10 something was the Spotify model. And I'm not trying to ridicule anybody, I'm just, it was a strange coincidence because this slide is about the Spotify model. Because wherever I go to a conference, I hear people talking about the Spotify model. And strangely enough, Spotify themselves say that they don't know how to scale it. <laughs> and yet, we are trying to go and do what Spotify have done five years back. When they do, did all the guilds and the tribes and everything, they were a small company. And now they are like, I don't know, 1,500 people. So these things don't work anymore. And yet we are trying to do the Spotify model. Do you know what this is, this, this image? It's something like an airplane built out of straw, like grass. So this is what happened, I don't know, in the 20th century, there was a war. Guess who was involved? The USA. And they were building their bases on some islands in the Pacific. So when they went to the Pacific Islands, they brought with them the cargo, like um, you know, food, clothes, batteries, devices and stuff. And the local tribes, seeing these things for the first time, they were pretty satisfied, <laughs> all these cool things. 
But then the war ended, and the, and the U.S. people went back to their hometowns, and the cargo was gone. So no more food, no more clothes, no more batteries. And what did these guys do? They started building the god statues. Where are our gods? They have abandoned us. How can we get the gods back and get the cargo back? So they started copying the planes that brought the cargo, but they didn't understand why the cargo was with them in the first place. So they were copying the shell and not the actual thing inside. And I think when we try to do the Spotify model or whatever model we we'll try to follow, that's what happens. Because we can only copy the shell and not what's inside. All right? And remember, this is something that the musician tells us. Right? He's not an agile coach. Here's what he also says. There's no course for that. And, and the context is becoming as good as anybody, as somebody else. So there's no course to that. There is no method to it. The only way to really get into it, if you really want to play like someone, is understand there is no easy way. And I would add, there's no safe way. Pun intended. The guys that come closest to me are the ones that play in my band and have dissected those songs to a professional level. It's a non-mechanical approach. And I want us to focus on the non-mechanical approach. I mean, there are a lot of musicians that can learn to play fast and everything, but it's a non-mechanical approach. The real, the best musicians are the ones that can compose, not the ones that, that can play, right? And when we go and check the checkbox, did we do the retrospection meeting? Yes. Did we do the stand-up? Yes. Did we do the... Yes. We did everything. It's a mechanical approach. We have to dissect the things we're doing. We have to understand why we're doing them. And only then it will start to make sense. A little bit more of Marty Friedman. <clears throat> he says, Ditch the scales already. A scale is something like an exercise you do on the guitar, like this, 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 this. the people who play guitar know what it is. I didn't explain it very well. But ditch the scales already. People tend to talk about music in relation to scales. But I don't think that way at all. I think in terms of phrases and melodies. And the interesting little inroads that go from one place to another over a chord or a series of chords. Marty says, melody, and I hear flow. We should try, as a company, or as companies, to implement flow across all our value streams. If you listen to a song, you like it. Why? Because it has a nice melody that comes to you with the right speed, with the right tempo, with the right volume. Everything is right. Yeah, all the instruments play together in a good uh, you know, synchrony. And imagine a team going agile in a company, and the team is like the drummer in a band. And the drummer starts doing this, very fast, like Rotting Christ. And then the guitar player is just starting with E minor, and he's you know, trying to do that, and the melody doesn't work. So if we optimize, we need to optimize the whole. We need to care about the melody. We need to care about the end-to-end -end flow in our companies. And not just that team or that team or that department. So it's like music. What else, says Marty? Just a few more, OK? <laughs> Bear with me. People want warm-up exercises and shortcuts. There aren't any. Get out there and play in bands to anyone you can. That's how you find out how to play well in your bedroom, you won't have the, uh, the right stimulus to play for real and avoid the ups. What is this? If it's not deliver faster, deliver frequently, I don't know what it is. And that's the musician telling it. We should get out there, deliver as much as we can, get the feedback, learn, you know, pull our hairs a bit, <laughs> then release again, learn, implement some corrections in our process, and so on and so forth. It's the same principles everywhere. It's not just in software, right? It's the same in music. And the last one from Marty is the following. Here's a great tip. One thing you want to avoid is playing fast unless it's absolutely necessary. 
If it's not needed, then playing fast totally sucks. If you get a call from Elton John about doing some session, he's not going to want to hear your eight finger tapping arpeggios. He'll send you straight out the door. So Paul McCartney won't want to in want your insane diminished either. You'll get fired. So that's again the same thought, optimizing the whole company. Don't play fast just because you can, or because your team is very good, or because you have the best scrum master, or whatever. Care about the whole, optimize the whole. So these are very, very wise words by a musician. So, do you know who this guy is? Anybody? Okay, cool, we have fans. Actually, this guy is a world-class fencer. You know, the people trying to kill each other, but not for real. And he's also a novelist. And he's also a screenwriter. And a radio host and a beer brewer. By the way, the beer is very good. A motivational speaker. A pilot. A successful pilot, because he's obviously alive. He's the siren. They call him the siren because when he starts singing, it's like a siren. He has a very strong voice. And I've had a band, and I was the vocalist, and I was singing his song, so I can confirm it's a very, very hard vocalist to cover. So I have proof for my band. You'll see it in a while. Of course, his, his Bruce Dickinson. This is Iron Maidens, my favorite band vocalist. And I want to play two short videos by Bruce Dickinson for you, because I think he's also giving some great, great advice. I'm sorry for the video quality and for the sound quality, but it's the best I could find. So this first question is people asking him, how he was able to do all these things. A singer, a writer, a novelist, a fencer, everything. So this is the question, he's reading the question now. Let's hear what he has to say. <laughs> your achievements are truly inspiring. What is your advice for keeping motivation and focus <laughs> during a very, very busy school? Well, I um, actually uh, try and do things uh, one thing at a time, because it's all I can manage. Um, and uh, I discovered that if I try to do two things at a time, um, like for example eating with a knife and fork, <laughs> whilst at the same time trying to play chess, one of them has to suffer, inevitably. So, as simple as it may sound, just do whatever it is you're doing, do that, and then do something else. All this stuff about multitasking, right? It's rubbish, <laughs> rubbish, absolute rubbish. Women cannot multitask. <laughs> Cannot multitask. <laughs> but some people are better at going from one thing to the other thing to the other thing to the other thing, and back to the other thing, and everything else like that. But they, if they're going to be successful at that, they're going to do one thing at a time and change rapidly from one to the other. That's not multitasking. That's figuring out how to change rapidly from one thing to the other. When I was a, a kid, <laughs> okay, uh, I won't go full screen be be because I'll go back to the movies in a while. Something strange is happening. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so here's what he's saying. I'm trying to do one thing at a time because it's all I can manage. And I think we heard a question uh, in the previous session, how do we manage all those initiatives without losing focus? Well, that's the answer. We should do one thing at a time, or at least 
we should try to limit the amount of work we do at a time. And if you know about Kanban, I will talk about Kanban obviously, but if you know about Kanban, you have heard already about the limiting work in progress notion, and that's what Mr. Dickinson is advising us to do. Let's see what else he has to offer. Is this going to happen again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and people find that hard to believe. That you would just go, I think I'm going to stop. And um, that's what happened. This was with Aaron. point in time that's what he's saying now you hate them I mean, no I, I thought they were quite nice chaps we were making lots of money uh, it, it, artistically we were going and playing for all these people uh, it was just, I felt that there was something out there in the world, something else. What? I don't know. If I knew what it was, I wouldn't go looking for it. <laughs> but you're not going to find it in the institution that is or was I made, or any other institution. Because we all surround ourselves in cotton wool in institutions. It's a comfortable place to be. And when you have nothing, when you have absolutely zero, I can sign a piece of paper that says, I owe you $300,000. I owe you $300 million. Because I have nothing. I don't care. I have nothing to lose. Maybe everything to gain. You can take a chance. When you're a billionaire, like Bill Gates, you can also do anything you want. Because you have lots you can lose without emotion. But when you're in the middle, you're kind of a prisoner. And I, I, I realized that my life, I, I, I could see myself at the age, approaching 30 years old, and I'm like, if I get to 60, and I've never gone out and found out what else is in the world, Wow, how sad would that be? You could end up like one of those 60 year old people who was just like bitter and I wished I'd done this, I wished I'd done that, I wished, wish, wish, wish. So, what precipitated me leaving Iron Maiden was one quote in the LA Times by Henry Miller, the artist. And I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember the exact quote, but it's basically all growth is an unpremeditated leap in the dark with no idea of where you are going to land. And I it's a long video and I'd like to to actually give you the exact quote by Henry Miller that Dickinson mentioned. It's all growth is a leap in the dark, a spontaneous, unpremeditated act without the benefit of experience. And right now I'm here standing in front of you and I'm trying to make a point. And the point is that if you truly want your company or your business to be agile, to achieve business agility, you need to accept the fact that you have to do that leap without knowing where you're going to land. It's always like that. If somebody promises you, you'll, it will be safe, and it will be uh, effortless, and it will be easy, they are trying to get your money. It's not easy. It's super hard. And uh, I think I know something about it because I've built a company, of course, with some other great people. And to build a company that's successful, almost out of nothing, because in Bulgaria, the venture fund, <laughs> you know, ecosystem is not the best you can get. 
So we, we basically build a company that's worth some eight digits now out of the money you could get for an expensive Audi or a BMW, I don't know. What's the best car in Germany? Sorry, in Greek. So how did we do that? We tried to be as agile as we could. And I, I, I can give you now the business agility tips from the metalhead CEO. <laughs> yeah. I told you I wasn't a band. <laughs> All right. So joking aside, I wasn't a band. So I, I decided I should, sh you know, I should show that. The first thing, let's define what business agility actually is, because you you read about that a lot, and I, I think there's no definition. So a very very smart person told that business agility is the ability of your business to effectively and efficiently satisfy its target markets through rapid experimentation and learning. In other words, it's navigating your complex landscape because every day something happens. When you own a business, every day is a small nightmare, a lot of problems you have to tackle. You have to navigate that somehow to survive, to prosper, to thrive. I think we were very successful with that, and now I, I will dare to say that I have 10 tips for you. 10 simple life tips. They're not a recipe, so don't copy them. Just have them in mind. All right? A quick recap, though, by the musicians, because I'm also a musician, obviously, but these guys told us, lean, agile, or non-mechanical. Copying others won't make you agile. The only way to really get it to agile is to realize there's no easy way. Focus on the whole. Get close to your customers and deliver as much as you can. Don't optimize single teams. Do one thing at a time. Be curious. Actually, Dickinson said that. Be curious. He, he quit Iron Maiden because he was curious what was out there. He wanted to explore. And he maybe, if he hadn't quit and he hadn't came back afterwards, they wouldn't have become that successful band they are today. He learned a lot. He had solo albums. He played in front of many audiences, he learned. That's what we should do. The first tip I have is use Kanban. And it's a very simple thing, I'm sure. How many of you use Kanban? Yeah, I think half of the people or even more. Uh, I just want to point out that you can do Kanban on a you know, physical board with sticky notes, and then you can do Kanban in a very, very complex environment. I urge you to check the Kanban maturity model. It's something that came out like three months back or something, and it describes more than 100 practices that you can do in Kanban. It's not just having sticky notes on the wall. Kanban is much, much more than that. So check the KMM Kanban maturity model. It's a very, very interesting read, and I'm sure you can learn a lot out of it. This was quick. Tip number two. Don't pile up waste. How many of you here are in IT or software development? Okay, almost everybody. Great, because this is software slide. In our company, these are the priorities that the engineering teams follow every day. If there's a customer issue, somebody from the team stops and takes care of the customer issue until full resolution. If there's no customer issue, then we go to regression issues. Regression issues is something that used to work before, but now it doesn't work. It's broken. Then we have internal issues, something that we ourselves as a team have discovered not to be working. We have technical debt. Ooh, technical debt. It's one of those words. And then new features. If you take a look at this, you might think we are crazy. How could we prioritize new features to be the last thing if our customers are actually paying us for the new features that we produce? Well, one to four, they are actually an investment you have to do regularly, constantly, all the time, in order to have some free time left for new features. And now it's the time that I brag about how many customer features we have in our company. 
Can you guess? It's zero. We have no customer issues. And the code base is more than one million lines of code. So it's a very, very big product. It doesn't mean we don't create customer issues, I want to point out. We create and we've fixed thousands of them. But because we do that, we have zero open customer issues. And I've asked audiences like this, do you have zero customer issues? I've never ever seen a hand go up. Let's try now. Do you have zero customer issues? Somebody wave because I can't see. Awesome. You're the, the first person ever to raise the hand, and I want to talk to you after this. I want to know what you're doing, because you're doing something right. It's how it should be. It's how it should be. Our customers are paying us money to use our products, and then we tell them, ah, you know, I have this new feature to work on, so go yourself, right? It doesn't work like that. We need to be fanatic about our customers, and that's my next tip. We need to be fanatic about customer support. This chart, it's called uh, cycle time scatter plot. It shows you a timeline on the X and a cycle time on, on the Y axis. Cycle time is how much time things take to complete. And I'm not sure how visible that is, but right here it says 70%. Right here it says 85%, right here it says 95%. And there is this horizontal line, like that, all the way to the left, where it says one, two, and three. What this chart shows you is our actual customer support board, Kanban board at Kanbanize. And it shows you that 70% of the time, we are able to resolve customer issues within one day. 85% within two days, 95% within three days, and then there are some outliers, of course. I could have photoshopped them, but I said, yeah, let's be honest. <laughs> so, but this is, this is not just getting a reply to the customer, all right? It's fixing a bug, deploying it to production, and the customer saying, yes, it works. So we are able to do that, 95% of the time within three days. And by the way, this also counts the weekends, not, and, and the official holidays and everything. So it's not just the working time, it's everything. And I'm not showing this to show off, well, a little. But I'm, I'm not trying to show off, I'm trying to make a point. If you are to be agile on the business level, this is the single service that you have to be absolutely perfect about. Why? Because the people who contact your support are the people who actually want to do something with your product, and they can't. People say, no support, perfect. <laughs> this is the worst, nobody cares about your product. If people contact your support, they really want to do something. And you should help them be successful. Because if they get successful, they will buy more your company will prosper, your business will grow. And what's the second point? When they ask you something, you can just say, can you do that? No, close the ticket. <laughs> no, we actually go ahead and ask them, why do you need that? What's your use case? What's your scenario? How do you imagine using this feature that you want to have? This is, our, our start. This is the start of our product management service. And we, I'll go now to the next slide, because this is how the feedback board in Kanbanize looks like. Uh, this is our own. I'm not trying to show the product, all right? I'm just trying to make a point. These things here, they are all Kanban cards. Each card inside contains feedback from a customer. You can see how many they are. And inside each card, could, there could be up to 20, 30, subtasks that also contain similar feedback for the same topic. So let's say this card right here, it was about having um, the ability to upload an avatar for your user. If one person asks for that, we put it right here under low priority. If many people ask for that, like five people ask for that, 
We create subtasks inside this and we push it upwards to medium priority. And if more than people ask for the same thing, we put 10 subtasks and put it right here. So essentially what you're seeing right here are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of feedback, feedback pieces from our customers. What most people do, collecting feedback, is either talking to somebody or having an automated voting system. I hate automated voting, voting systems. Why? Because you don't know what the context is. These things have all been collected manually, one by one, copy-paste by email or manually doing stuff. We are fanatic about this. When we talk to support, I mean, when the support folks talk to somebody, they get the, the context, they ask why, 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 and then we fill in this here. That's how we know what our customers want. If we were to be agile, if our company is to be agile, we need to know what our customers want. That's the first rule. If you don't know what they want, you can try whatever you want, the Spotify model, whatever model, you won't be agile. I'm sorry to say so. So be fanatic about your customer, customer's feedback. All right, so tip number five. Your manage management has to teach everybody on Agile. What usually happens, we get a training for the teams. The management is super busy. They don't attend the training because they know these things. And then two weeks later, nothing changes. We, we saw that in the previous presentation uh, where Javier talked about this. Everybody should be trained. Actually, if there's one team to be trained, it has to be the senior management team because they should be able to teach their subordinates and their subordinates should be able to teach their subordinates and that's how the whole company should work. If you can't, of course, if you don't know these things, get the coach, work with them, train the management, but then I would say leave it to the management. That's what Toyota do. It's in, in Toyota, the, the fathers of Lean, they actually had a master-apprentice relationship for a long, long time. They were living through Lean. It's, it's not like, uh, read this book and you're ready. They were doing it every day, every day. And actually, respect for people, which is one of Toyota's principles, is the acknowledgement by the management that the people can't do the work themselves. And we, as managers, have to help them. That's respect for people. It's not buying a table of football or whatever. It's not having free lunch. Respect for people is acknowledging people can't do the work themselves. All right. Yeah, that's a very nice quote, by the way, by Teichi Ono. Teichi Ono is the father of TPS. He created TPS, Toyota Production System. He says, people who only look at the numbers are the worst of all. Don't be that manager that only looks at budgets and salaries and stuff. Go out there, work with your guys. Okay, tip number six, foster horizontal leadership. We all know the hierarchy. We also saw it in the previous session. We all live in silos in one form or another. But if we have to get the product out, like a new product out the door, how does it work? Marketing or sales or somebody with business background talks to the customers. They conceptualize a new product. Then somebody builds it, builds it, and then we go out and sell it. It might be in parallel, all these things. It doesn't, it's not important for this specific slide. The fact is that value generation happens horizontally, like that. It doesn't happen like that or like that. It's horizontal. And in my experience, I have discovered that one person that can actively engage other people from other silos horizontally is easily worth 10 silo thinking guys. So my advice to building this kind of collaboration is find these people that can engage others in other silos effectively, of course, and do whatever you can 
to keep them, to promote them, to, to keep them happy, to make them happy, whatever. Just find those people. These are usually product managers. They could be project managers. I don't know why project management is a bad word in Agile. In the, in the previous session, people laughed when somebody said project management. I don't think it's bad. You need it. I mean, the less you need it, the better, of course, but you need it. Somebody has to, to make the things work. Unless we live in, in a perfect, perfect world, but we never ever live in a perfect, perfect world. So find those people, do whatever you can, help them, give them autonomy, and they will build it for you. That's my tip. Find your PMs. Whether that's product or project manager, it doesn't matter. My next tip, convert hippos to hypos. In my company, I'm the big fat guy, literally. So my opinion versus anybody's opinion is the most important because I'm the CEO. I can do whatever I want. But if somebody shows me data, then things change. If you're that reasonable, you can't argue with data, right? And what we've seen a lot, in my experience and everybody else's experience, is that there's a war on opinion. We should do this. No, we should do that. And there's two hours of meeting, people arguing what we should build. And then I read a book. It's called You Should Test That. A very, very nice book. I recommend it. And the author said, if you don't know the answer, test it. It's that simple. So if you don't have the data, collect the data and convert the, the highest person, uh, highest paid person's opinion to high probability options. So high probability option is something that could work. It's backed up by data. And you have, to, you have run some small tests to, to collect that data and to prove that it could actually work. Don't take decisions out of your guts. Sometimes it work. It works more often than not, it doesn't. So this is uh, one of my almost last tips. This, the next one is everything is an experiment. In Kanban we made a lot of mistakes, really a lot, but one of the big mistakes we've made with the product was that we considered a feature to be done when it gets to production. And let's take the example again about the avatar. So somebody wants to upload an avatar, we make that feature, we make it available, people have it, done, check. But are they using it? If you have 20 million users, and only five people uploaded an avatar and actually make use of that feature. Is it a success? No, obviously not. So one thing we didn't do for a long, long time, and we're doing now, is to follow through on all the things we create and actually check whether they hit the goals they were supposed to hit. We treat everything as an experiment. Well, not everything, but m the majority of things we treat as, as experiments. And I think this is also very important for any company that's going to be agile as a company. Business agility is about a company going agile. You should treat everything as an experiment. Nothing is carved in stone. Nothing is set in, is set in stone. All right. My second last tip. It's about how you get to turn the ship around, right? If, you, if you're an agile company, you have to be able to change direction quickly. You have an opportunity to realize big benefit for whatever, you have to change course quickly. It takes usually months for smaller companies and it takes years for bigger companies. We saw that in the previous presentation as well. And I have a theory it, it, it's proven with a couple of use cases, but it's still a theory that if you apply Kanban on all levels in your company, from the CEO to the team level, this could be a three level hierarchy, five level hierarchy, 10 level hierarchy, depends on the company. So if you apply Kanban across all layers, 
And then you connect those boards so that strategic initiatives at the top, right here, are parent cards for programs, for projects, or, you know, you can, you can ignore the project work, uh, word if you want to. And then you go all the way down to the team level. If this is all connected, then you have a Kanban system across your entire company. And if you have a ship and the captain pulls that lever, then the whole ship will turn left because these are all connected. 90% of CEOs fail, and I know that <laughs> because I've read a lot about CEO failures. They fail because they cannot execute their strategy. They have it right here in their mind, it's perfect. It just doesn't happen because these guys here, they're working on something else and there's a big disconnect right here. So if your company is to grow and become fully, fully agile, you should think about this kind of a problem. How do you connect the strategy with the actual execution? And to me, this is the approach. There could be other approaches. There, there must be other approaches. I'm just recommending this one. And my last tip for today, be inclusive, just like music. This guy is George. In Greek, is it Georgie? Giorgio. Georgios. This guy was the waiter in my hotel restaurant this morning. When he saw me with, with this t-shirt, he said, yeah, Iron Maiden. And I said, yeah, Iron Maiden. So we were like the, the minions, these yellow. <laughs> but we didn't care about who was like what. He could have seen me and said, oh, this metalhead, he knows nothing. I could have seen him say, ah, this waiter, he knows nothing. We didn't care about who was what. Right? We were inclusive to one, one another. And we took that, that photo, and I have now this great memory from Greece. So my, my last advice, and this is the most powerful advice I can ever give, be inclusive towards others. Your Agile is not better than my Agile, or your, or your Lean, or your Spotify model. We should be inclusive of everyone's ideas. We should invite people, talk to them, change together, and evolve experimentally. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitar. Thank you. OK. So let's take some, uh, let's have a quick discussion, shall we? Dimitar, I'd like you to stick around so we can, we can take some questions from our, from our, our audience. Uh, comments, questions, remarks. Please, ah, uh, oh, there we are, a raised hand. Let's hear the guy with zero bucks afterwards. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask something about uh, everything is an experiment. So it's a beautiful idea to follow through uh, on everything you put on production and see whether it's, uh, it has satisfied its uh, initial purpose. Uh, what I'm wondering is, in practice, what is the next step? For example, you see that um, a feature that you deployed, you, you were thinking, OK, it's a game changer, and it actually isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do next? Do you... Uh, roll it back, or even more important, how do you, in practice, incorporate this knowledge into the decision-making process of the next features? Yeah, great, okay. So what we do is the following. First of all, we have metrics. We collect metrics whether people use this feature or not. If they don't use it at all, it means that we haven't made it clear that this feature exists. And then the measure would be to show some small onboarding window. Hey, we have this new thing. Go try it out. Right. So this is one thing. If they are using the feature and they, are, they don't like it, we usually understand that through support. Because with the, the years, people got to realize that our support is very responsive. This is actually a great point for my other slide. If, if your support is very slow, people won't write 
to support because they will know it will take forever. And when they know it will take one day or two days to happen, they will send the feedback quickly. So we, we always know because of this great uh, response time, we always know if something doesn't work for them. They say, we don't like that, we like this, and then support kicks in and they ask questions, why don't you like it, how could we make it better, and, uh, and that's how we evolved uh, the feature. That's what usually happens for us. And one other thing we're, I, I wouldn't say we're starting with, but we've been having it for six months now. It's early adopters program. So we, some of our customers get everything new in advance and we, we get this preliminary feedback quickly and if something is really bad, we change it on the spot and then it goes to production. That's what I can give as an advice. Yes? Hi. I'm also made in fun, by the way. <laughs> um, question again on the same topic, on the experimentation topic. I guess for small companies like Ambanize, it's, it's more straightforward, more easy to implement. But for larger scale organizations where such experiments are typically tied to, to budgets and mm -hmm. uh, you know money that could be considered uh, having been thrown down the drain and people people's personal stakes being assigned to such experiments how would you recommend or suggest that larger scale organizations should go about implementing such a culture being able to sort of let go and you know drop things that might have cost a couple yeah. of uh, hundreds of thousands or even million euros yeah. in certain cases. Yeah, great question. Uh, what we have in Camera, you're right. Experimentation in small companies is infinitely easier than in, in big companies by, by any, any means. What we have in Camera is a budget that says an experiment should not cost more than $1,000 if it's a small one. And if it's a big one, it shouldn't cost more than $10,000. That's that's our numbers. In big companies, these numbers would be greater, although I'm not sure they should be. It depends on the experiment itself, but what I could recommend is having a budget, an experiment budget. It's a way to shape th people's thinking that they can spend those money, completely burn them, and nobody would go there and punish them. That's, that's what we do. It's a small budget, go ahead, try something, burn it. If it works, it works. We've burned some cash with that, by the way. Um, so this is one part. The second part is make a duration uh, SLA, like service level agreement for the experiment. We've had some struggles with that. We said, okay, let's experiment with this. And then it goes on for a year. This, this doesn't work well. Set some limit, six months, three months, nine months, whatever. I would go for something between one and three months if it's possible. If it's not, you figure it out. Define those to budget and time frame. And then I think sh things should go better. But, you know, you have, to, you have to test. You have to test it. Let's take a few more. We have some time. Let's hear the guy with zero bucks, please. Where is the guy with zero <laughs> Where is he? Where is he? He's Could you please tell there. us what you do? How come you have zero bucks? Zero ah, uh, <laughs> okay, this doesn't count. This doesn't count. <laughs> okay, uh, I didn't say that we have zero bucks, but we have zero complaints. And the thing is that, uh, as you said, we try to get, uh, the soon as possible, uh, feedback from the customer before we release the production. So that's our key point so far. It works really good. Is it a big product? Yeah, yes, it's a ticketing product uh, for large tournament events. So we, we have to be really careful and really move quickly in order not to have uh, uh, complaints for, because our clients, it's, it's not only the uh, organizing committees, but it's also the end user that he wants to have a good user experience and not complain because he will not be able to attend to Iron Maiden concert. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, good, good job. Okay. We have a question. We have to, a question to down to here. People right here. Get down there. It's a lot of exercise for you. That's okay. I'll be fine. <laughs> I should do that more no, often. Hi. Hello. Angela from the States. Uh, the zero bug uh, topic is a favorite one of mine in a former role 
doing delivery for a big ServiceNow platform for a large pharmaceutical company. Uh, that was, uh, I was very proud of that. We had zero defect releases. Nothing went to production with a, with a defect. And, you know, and I, I, I knew how that compared with my colleagues who had all the other different business systems and they would run regularly with hundreds, thousands of defects of various kinds at any given moment. And the key was, it's always collaboration and feedback, you know, just being a fanatic about it. Uh, and since I was also a manager as well, as sort of like the Scrum Master RTE, you know, for the, the platform, that was my requirement, right? So we had maybe at least four, if not five, um, feedback loops built in, uh, and everything had to have been tested by everybody and, you know, accepted before it even hits a release. It was very clean. Great, a great job. And we have two people and I've never ever had that experience before. Two people with zero books in this audience. You're, you guys are great. So uh, one, one, one thing I'd like to add is about technical excellence. We've had this issue for a while, but being really fanatical about technical excellence also gives a very good leverage for that. And one thing I didn't mention explicitly, you, you can have customer bugs, but don't allow them to pile up like unresolved piles of bugs. This is really terrible. We had something from the gentle gentleman behind you. Yeah. Hi. Um, is there any threshold that you use in the return on investment of these small experiments that you conduct? When you have several of them, how do you choose between them? Which one would you tackle first? Which one would you hunt first? Great, great question. We actually track our experiments on the Kanban board because everything in Kanban is the Kanban board, everything. I mean, even hiring and everything. So we have Kanban boards for all teams, and if, if there's an experiment, we track it on the board. And naturally, we have work in progress limits. For the experiments, it's something between four and six, depends on the team. So if we hit that limit, we know we shouldn't go above that. If we hit the limit and we learn, and we feel we can do more, we can increase the limit and do more but it's actually the, the other way around. We are trying too many things at a time. So having a limit on the experiments is something very important. And how do we prioritize them? Well, the ones that come from me are the most important, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm not joking about that. We have strategy. Each company has a strategy. If the CEO wants something, this is the highest priority. I mean, if it's, uh, let me rephrase that. If it's strategic and it has something to do with the, the goals of the company, it has to come first. Because it's, it's usually I need to learn something. Will that work? Let's say some marketing initiative. Will it work? Because if it doesn't work, then my whole plan goes to hell. And I don't want that. I'm projecting growth because I expect this to, to, to turn out to be true. So these things go first because their cost of delay is the biggest. Uh, and then we can, we can try with other things. We, we naturally go and prioritize by cost of delay. We don't have a formula for that, but if, if something is going to cost us a lot, then it goes first. All right, if we don't have any more questions or comments, I'd like to thank Dimitar for his fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very valuable insights.